Hello, I'm going to talk today about adolescent telephemoral pain. We're going to particularly look at the differences between adolescent and adult PFP because there are distinct differences that we can glean from the literature. So we need to look at those. A few facts and figures to get you going. So up to 28.9% of adolescents have telephemoral pain. So nearly a third of all adolescents, it's big numbers. And historically, it was viewed as a self-limiting condition um, in children and or adults. But actually, the literature that's been coming through in the last few years shows that in kids, 75% of them will still have their symptoms at a year. So we really shouldn't be viewing this necessarily as a self-limiting condition. I would be very careful with the term chondromalacia patelli. Strictly speaking, that refers to retropatellar change. Uh, on the uh, retropatellar cartilage. But what we know is that actually, even in teenagers, it's quite a common finding, a little bit of light, su um, superior, sorry, superficial uh, change, irregularity in that uh, retropatellar cartilage. The cross on the triangle where you think represents the amount of each one might be quite high. Whereas if you had a teenager that had just fallen, banged their knee, they were a bit sore, but they weren't catastrophizing about it, we might have our cross down in that right-hand corner. So we're going to think about joint loading, contact pressures. Also remember if we've got a strange uh, positioning of the patella relative to the trochlea, that will also disturb the balance of soft tissues. So the parapatella soft tissues will have uh, potentially be under stretch, be under compression. So the pain might be coming from those two. So why does it matter? You know, you might argue, well, it's just a little bit of pressure pain. Well, this very recent study, it's a large study, as we can see here, 316 participants of adolescents, which is particularly difficult getting pediatric research done. So that's an impressive volume. And more than 50% said that they were aware of their knee problem daily. More than a third reported severe lack of confidence in the knee. And unfortunately, if someone has got dysplasia, they're more likely to develop accelerated premature patellofemoral joint osteoarthritis because they have the extra movement, extra shear going on across the patella. So they might not be dislocating, but that extra movement, maybe subluxation, can, can lead to problems down the line. So when we're thinking about dysplasia in this situation, we're thinking about three things. We're thinking about the shape of the trochlea. We're thinking about the length of the patella tendon. And we're thinking about where the tubercle is. So in other words, where the quads attachment is. And we can think about it like this on a spectrum. As always with everything in medicine, the, these things are on a spectrum. And you might have one thing that is particularly bad. Everything else is normal. Or you might have some subtle change in all of them, which collectively actually leads to quite a bit of instability. So that vertical line down the middle, we want the tubercle bang underneath the trochlea, but often it's lateralized. So the quads therefore constantly creating a lateralized pull and a lateral force onto the patella. So we've talked about intrinsic factors there, bony shape or tendon length. So they are in the shopping basket, as I call it. So this concept of what are the risk factors for pain and or instability. We might have other intrinsic things like hypermobility. We might have excessively pronating foot, but we might have extrinsic factors too, like stair volume, shoes, training load. And then we're going to have psychosocial load. If we think about that top of the triangle that I was just talking about. So is this basket getting a bit overloaded and what can we remove from it? I can't change the trochlear shape, but I can certainly put them into a better shoe or get them stronger or look at fine motor control. And there is some research to show that the more factors, the more likely you are to have pain and functional restriction. So let's think about load management a bit more. So Michael Rathless in Denmark's done a lot of work with adolescent telephemoral pain. And he found that when you ask kids with patellofemoral pain how much sport they're doing, the graph is completely polarized. So two thirds were doing more than five lots of sport a week, so loads, 
and the other third are doing nothing. Virtually nobody in the middle. So that really sends a message, doesn't it, around load. But the greatest correlation when they looked at environmental factors with the girls was lack of sleep, self-dietary restraint, and interlinked with that fear of weight gain. So we need to be really aware of this when we're advising about reduction in running load or reduction in uh, overall exercise load because we could actually increase that anxiety if anxiety about weight gain is driving them to do the exercise. So can we explore with our patients, why do you like to run? What is it that makes you go up for a run? See if we can get into their mindset about it and, and help them navigate that and how powerful that education is. So is strength an issue at all? We don't want them landing like you can see on the right there, dropping into functional valgus. Well, actually in adolescence, this is one of the biggest differences between adolescence and adult PFP. There is no evidence to show there's a decrease in isometric hip and knee strength compared to age match subjects. So personally, I feel that it's more around kinesophobia and poor motor control, particularly at times of growth. Just like we see our teenagers sometimes get a bit clumsy, you know, trip over, catch their feet. There's that poor communication for a while between brain and legs. So times of growth or just after growth. And um, is their mode of control sufficient for what they want to do? Like, you know, can they land from a jump? It's one thing walking around with it, sufficient control, but can they jump and land well? So how are we going to measure our um, adolescent uh, patellofemoral pain? Other emerging literature, just to sort of flag up, really, uh, this paper again from this year, perhaps no surprise, but overweight and obesity in young adults with patellofemoral pain demonstrates that those patients have reduced strength and poorer functional capacity. So if we understand the fact that obesity rates are rising so much, we need to have on our radar that probably this is affecting the patellofemoral joint both through load but also through increasing systemic inflammation. So aggravated landing from a jump in netball, stair descent after netball for the rest of the day but not into the next day, kneeling is fine. Over 24 hours, no pain or stiffness on waking, fine until plays netball, pain on stairs one to two hours post netball. Okay, so what am I thinking here? The fact that the pain does not go into the next day suggests very little inflammation, so that's good. No stiffness on waking makes it less likely to be tendon. And the kneeling is fine, makes it less likely to be fat pads, syndrome and larsen Johansson syndrome, or Oscar Schlatter's. All of those are sore when they're inflamed to kneel on. So that level of growth will alter the relative length of the soft tissues. It will alter proprioception. And the trochlear shape can alter at that age with that final main growth spurt. I need to ask about the total training across the week. We can see more trainings come in, but I didn't want to map out the whole week. So overarchingly about adolescent patellofemoral pain, think load. I would put that absolutely as number one. So the neurological fine control of the movement is more important than strength itself. That has clearly been shown and that really fits in my experience too. Watch out for instability. Remember, then it won't necessarily come in and say my patella is unstable. They'll come in and say, my, I've got a painful knee, but it may be driven by instability. Be on your toes for these other pathologies you know, they're not all common at all, thankfully. But if you don't know about them at all, you'll never pick them up. So just have that knowledge there in case there is something masquerading as patellofemoral pain. So I do hope you've enjoyed that. I do hope that makes uh, for a bit more clarity for you for the differences between adolescent and uh, adults patellofemoral pain. And if you've enjoyed that and you'd like a little bit more um, patellofemoral pain information, a, a very much of a practical, applicable nature, then um, have a think about doing my online physio tutors course. Thank you.